Welcome, gamers. I am Manriah Titans, the host of the Weekend Game Show and writer for the Opinions and Truth blog, where I educate on and discuss different aspects of game development to show why video games can take years to make to prevent another Cyberpunk 2077 launch scenario. And one of the ways I do this is with the Let's Read Some Shit videos, where I read aloud portions emphasis on portions for DMCA and copyright reasons of a couple of books regarding video games, their creation, their impact on the world to show the, to show the legitimacy of video games as an artistic medium and or whatever I feel like reading at the time. In addition, I also hope to promote literacy as a whole. I also provide artist shoutouts to human artists to combat AI art theft. All of them can be found on the Become Empowered Instagram, all one word, one E in the middle, all rights reserved by the artist, hashtag create, don't scrape. If this is something you're interested in, then you can find the other videos on my YouTube channel under the handle at Monroe Titans, and also on Buy Me a Coffee, where educational quotes regarding video games and literacy are shared. If you tip through Buy Me a Coffee, 15% of the proceeds Minimum, go to Kids Need to Read, whose mission is to help children discover the joy of reading and the power of a literate mind. So, getting to the read-alouds. Let us read some shit. There we go. All right, so these tend to go about an hour-ish, can be longer, and they go as follows. I uh, read the summary on the back of the book, if applicable. Read the forward and preface, if applicable. If there is no introduction, read part of the first chapter. Forward and preface. There we go. Today, I'll be reading portions of the psychology workbook for writers, tools for creating realistic characters and conflict in fiction by Darian Smith. And book two, Write Great Beginnings, How to Start a Novel, Hook Readers from Page One, Avoid Common First Chapter Problems by Sandra Girth. Had both of these for I don't know how long. I'm hoping with these read alouds, it sparks some interest in having me read these thingamajigs. Also, if you're following me on the Monraya Titans Instagram, you will recognize the psychology workbook for writers because it was yesterday's never ending reading list edition. So, Let us start. All right, the philosophy workbook for writers. Summary on the back. Writers know that their characters and stories should be multi-layered and believable. Now here's a simple workbook that uses the same knowledge that gives therapists insight into human behavior to create fiction that hits the mark. Each chapter outlines an aspect of psychological theory as it can be used for writing and provides two worksheets to translate it into action. One to develop characters, one to develop the story. Darian Smith is a prize-winning fiction writer with a degree in psychology and a member of the New Zealand Association of Counselors. He combines these two sides of his background to provide simple, easy-to-follow tools that make use of established psychological theory to help writers develop fully rounded, interesting, realistic characters and inject conflict into their stories. Give your writing the benefit of over a decade of training and experience and discover how to have readers wanting more. Okay, so. They have an introduction and then they go right into the first chapter. Since there is no forward and preface, I will read the introduction and the first chapter until we get to that first worksheet. All right. Introduction. 
Writing is a form of psychology. Writers, the good ones anyway, are keen observers of human nature and they capture it in their characters and storytelling. They show the behaviors and thought processes and the ways people make meaning out of their experiences and events and turn these into provoking entertainment. A lot of this is done by instinct or by the gradual buildup of experience and skill, but established psychological theories and counseling ideas can help shortcut this process and enable writers to create compelling, well-rounded, understandable characters and interesting stories that make sense to the reader. My own interest in these two fields and how they might combine started at university where I completed a bachelor degree with a double major in psychology and English literature. I followed it up with a diploma in counseling, became a member of the NZ Association of Counselors, and started up in private practice. I was already writing fiction in my spare time, and soon realized that much of the success or failure of a story hangs on the characters it contains. A well-rounded chapter with interesting relationships and complex conflict with other fully developed characters, gives a reader something to connect to. It makes them care what happens next. I started thinking about how to use what I know about psychology to create more believable characters to draw the reader in. I realized a novel, Currents of Change, and the reader review started saying things like, Great characterization. The characters are very human and a really fun book to read. It worked. I prevent... Yeah, I've presented on this topic to writers groups on several occasions and always get a really positive response from the audience. I think because it doesn't take long to see how thinking about these elements adds depth to your characters and consequently your story. Realistic characters have internal monologues about themselves and the world around them. They have strengths and weaknesses, history, family dynamics, relationships, personality, conflict styles. They have psychology. In this book, I aim to outline several counseling and psychological theories with a view to how they help writers. These theories help therapists make sense of personality, human interaction, conflict, self-sabotage, and more. For your characters to be realistic, they need to contain these attributes, just like real people do. Each chapter will outline a theory or concept as simply as possible, I'll provide examples from literature and movies to demonstrate what it is being talked about. Demonstrate what is being talked about and two worksheets with questions to help you apply the theory to your own work. One to help build your characters and one to help build your story. But I already know my characters and story, you may say. Great. This will help you drill down into what really makes them tick and add layers to them. It will also help you bring out the elements that you know in new and interesting ways to show readers. Even writers with a strong understanding of human nature sometimes find it a challenge to apply that understanding to their writing. By doing this in a conscious process, you will gradually integrate it into your instinctive writing behavior. The difference between writers and therapists, of course, is that therapists are working to help clients resolve their issues and writers are creating issues for their characters. This is how they bring conflict into the story. This book is not intended as a self-help book or for therapeutic use. It will condense several years of training into a few pages designed to be useful for a writer, not a therapist. The focus here will be on creating trouble, not fixing it. To summarize, this is for your characters, not your friends and family. Use as much or as little as you are comfortable with. Most therapists settle on a couple of favorite approaches in the way they work, and that's okay for writers too. Some theories cover the same ground, but a different path, so find the one that suits you best. Use what makes sense to you, and throw away the rest. But try it first. Practice, and think about each of these theories and elements. I guarantee they will help add depth to your writing. So, chapter one. And I'm both amused and concerned by it. It's called Blame the Parents. The theory. Tell me about your mother. 
It said in a Sigmund Freud accent. This is the second most cliched quote from therapist. Beaten only by, and how does that make you feel? Psychology has a bit of a reputation for blaming parents for things. It's a little unfair, but there's some truth to it. Human beings learn much of their understanding of the world and how it works well before their brains are developed enough to objectively evaluate what they're learning. That means the influence of our early years have a huge impact on how we behave later in life. Parents and other authority figures, both intentionally and unintentionally, contribute hugely significant messages to our developing brains. So, while a therapist will be quick to point out that it's not actually about blame, but about identifying the root cause of an issue so the adult self can assess those early messages and beliefs with more rational logic, as a writer, it's important for us to understand the kinds of early messages our characters were given so that we understand how they operate in the now of the story we're telling. So what kinds of messages are there? The counseling theory known as transactional analysis has handily split these into two types, injunctions and drivers, listed in TA Today, Ian Stewart, Van Joinus. Uh, Van Yonez. Close. I'll spell the last name. J-O-I-N-E-S. Injunctions are the don't messages. On a subconscious level, they tell your character that they're not an okay person because they're not allowed to do or do be these particular things. These messages are rarely given intentionally, but usually picked up through behavioral cues and cues. Okay, that's what I said. And absorbed into the subconscious. They're a great source of insecurity for a character. They include don't feel. Ergo, don't cry, don't have emotions, or keep them to yourself if you do. Don't be long, ergo, put. Uh, put down roots is a bad, putting down roots is a bad idea. You're a loner and you don't belong anywhere. Don't be you. Ergo, who you are isn't good enough and is wrong. You should be more sporty, academic, quiet, straight. You should be like your brother. Don't think, ergo, boys don't like smart girls. If I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. Smarty pants. Mm. Don't exist. Ergo, my life was great before I had kids. I had to give up my career to have you. Ouch. Don't be close. Ergo, you shouldn't get attached. People hurt you or you'll hurt them. Don't grow up. Ergo, children are cute. It's a pity they have to turn into teenagers. Don't be important. Ergo, stop trying to get attention. Don't be well, ergo, I feel good when I'm talking after you. Hmm? Anyway, don't make it. Ergo, nobody in this family does anything worthwhile. Don't get too big for your boots. Ergo, not Erica. What? <laughs> Don't be a child. You need to be the adult and look after me. Drivers, on the other hand, are more positive messages and often given intentionally. They are the messages that drive us to achieve and tell us we are okay as long as we follow their advice. These messages can become problematic if they are absolutes. This can mean we only feel good about ourselves as long as we can fulfill the driver's command. They include try hard, hurry up, Please others, be perfect, be strong. Internal conflict in a character can be built by selecting a combination of injunctions and drivers that function as a kind of psychological tug of war within the character as they try to meet the requirements of the messages in order to feel good about themselves. Ergo, I shouldn't be important, but it's okay as long as I'm perfect. Whoa! 
or I'll only belong and have people care about me if I do what I can to please others. Or I shouldn't have feelings, and I do, so I have to hide them and appear to be strong so as to be accepted. I'd say that last one was a bit of a cliche if it wasn't overdone in life. Anyway, part of the character's journey is to learn about him or herself in the course of the story. Creating an internal conflict to wrestle with keeps the character interesting to the reader. They may or may not resolve the conflict. In therapy, the objective is to help a client find a way to give themselves permission to let go or mitigate these messages in healthy ways. Your character could do this through their experiences in the story, or they may not. But their struggle with the messages and their implications for their adult life and behavior will make for an engaging read. I believe it. Example. In the Disney movie Frozen, a perfect example. In the Disney movie Frozen, Princess Elsa, who later becomes Queen Elsa, picks up very strong messages from her parents after an accident involving her ice magic. She receives the injunctions, don't be you, don't be close, don't feel, and don't belong. In order to feel good about herself, she also must adhere to the driver messages of be perfect and please others. These messages come from the adult's fears and tell her to hide her powers and who she is, staying in control always, or else she could do serious harm to her loved ones and her country. It is not until Elsa gives herself permission to let go of some of these messages that she can truly be herself, gain control of her life and her powers, and protect the ones she loves. This internal story arc for the character is a huge part of what makes the movie resonate with the audience. For further reading, TA Today by Ian Stewart and Van, I'm going to spell the last name again, J-O-I-N-E-S, Life Space Publishing, 1987. 1987. And this brings us to the first worksheet. So onward to the next book. And oh, that was around 1723. For timestamps, because I'm going to be exporting this to YouTube. I want to know where things end. All right, then. Onward to book two. Right Great Beginnings by Sandra Girth. I don't remember if I said her name in the beginning, but that's okay. I said it now. Summary on the back. Where it's supposed to be if it's not on the inside front cover. The beginning is the most important part of your book. The first chapter, probably, even the first page, is what makes agents and editors accept or reject a manuscript. And it's what makes readers decide to buy a book or pick another. Not wrong. But writing a compelling opening is hard because there are so many things a great beginning needs to do and so many mistakes to avoid. In this book, Sandra Girth draws on her experience as an editor and a best-selling author to teach you where to start your novel. How to avoid common first chapter problems and how to hook your readers from the very first page. Each character of this practical guide includes concrete examples and exercises that will help you write an irresistible beginning. Write an irresistible beginning. Sorry, I was yawning when I said that. Okay, so... What do they have? So, part one. Introduction. Yep, so there's no forward or preface. So I will read part one introduction and then the first chapter. Why is the font so damn small? Sorry, I was looking ahead. So part one, introduction, the importance of the opening by writing a great beginning is crucial. I have a feeling you already understand that the beginning of your book is important. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have bought this book. But the beginning isn't just important. It's the most important part of your book. Sure, it's essential to write a captivating middle and a satisfying end too, but it's the opening that will make an editor decide to accept your manuscript for publication. 
Even if you're an indie author who self-publishes and doesn't have to impress agents or editors, writing a great beginning is still vital because you do have to impress readers as they buy or don't buy your book based on its opening. Your opening is the first thing literary agents, acquisition editors, and readers will see of your story. They will judge your book and your writing skills in general based on the first few pages they read. Yeah, this is your chance to make a good first impression. More often than not, you won't get another. If your beginning is weak, it doesn't matter how brilliantly written the rest of your book is. Readers, agents, and editors will never find out about the clever plot twists in Chapter 11, your action-packed showdown, or your moving ending because they will stop reading long before they get to the good parts. Right, your beginning is a marketing tool. This is all part of part one. It has, it has. Oh, I like this book already. I regret not reading it sooner. Because it has little titles for the different sections. Making it easy to read. Oh, I love it. Anyway, your beginning is a marketing tool. The first few pages of your book are actually a marketing tool. As award-winning crime novelist Mickey Spillane said, the first chapter sells the book. Mickey Spillane. Wow. Said, the first chapter sells the book. Think about how readers... <coughs> how do you choke on air? Anyway, where was I? Uh, think about how readers make the decision to buy a book. For most readers, it goes like this. Cover or title of the book draws their attention, so they read the description, which is commonly called the blurb. If the blurb sounds interesting, they will usually open the book to the first page, or if they are shopping at an online bookstore, click on the sample. On most online retailer sites, that sample contains the first 10% of the book. So that part of the story is especially crucial. If readers get to the end of the excerpt and find themselves hooked, they'll buy the book. If the, if the beginning doesn't capture their attention, they'll move on and buy another book. Nowadays, readers' attention spans are short. No kidding. They won't patiently read several chapters waiting around for something interesting to happen. You only have a page or two to convince readers to buy your book or editors to accept your manuscript. Beginnings are hard to write, yet many writers struggle to create a great opening for their book. Rewind. So I'm, because that, thinking about it, that was confusing. So next section of part one, beginnings are hard to write. Yet many writers struggle to create a great opening for their book. Writing a rooting beginning is one of the hardest parts of the writing process for many authors. They agonize over their opening chapters. They rewrite, revise, and polish them over and over without ever feeling completely satisfied with their story beginning. Other writers are convinced they have written the perfect opening. Only to be rejected by a literary agent by a literary agent or an editor, or have the book not sell well. If you are struggling with your opening chapters or are aiming to write a book, that will be accepted by agents and publishers and eagerly bought by, re and eagerly bought by readers, this guide is for you. Next section, what this book will teach you. As the senior editor of a small publishing house, I'm in charge of reading submissions and deciding what manuscripts are accepted for publication. We reject manuscripts for a lot of different reasons, but most of the time it's because the opening failed to capture our interest or the writer committed one of the mistakes that are common in opening chapters. A beginning that is too slow, lacks conflict, or starts in the wrong place. During the course of this book, I'll teach you how to avoid these mistakes and how to write an opening that will keep agents, editors, and readers reading. Whether you're a novice writer working on your first book or an established author who has already published multiple novels, this guide will help you decide where to start your book, write a kick-ass first line, 
hook your readers from the very first page, avoid openings that are boring, cliched, or misleading, decide whether opening your book with a prologue is a good idea, get your readers emotionally involved in your story as soon as possible, introduce your characters and your setting, pick a point of view and tense for your story, incorporate backstory and descriptions without stopping the momentum of your story, Discover what types of openings to avoid. Understand the three-act structure and the elements of the first act. Create chapter endings that will make readers keep reading. Next section. How to get the most out of this book. Each chapter of this book ends with practical exercises that will help you apply what you are learning to your manuscript. While you're reading this book, I suggest you stop after every chapter and do the exercises. I know it's tempting to skip this step, thinking you'll come back and do the exercises later, but if you are anything like me, you might be too busy to read the book a second time. So take the time to work on the exercises while everything is fresh in your mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Print out the first three chapters of your manuscript or set up a file in your favorite writing app and do the exercises as you finish each chapter. By the time you get to the end of this guide, I'm confident that you'll have a beginning that will hook agents, editors, and readers alike. <coughs> if you are hearing me cough, I apologize. I'm trying to cover up the mic with my hand. A note on the examples I use. A few of the examples I use throughout this book are from my own novels written under my pen name, J. J A E. And they put their website in here, https colon slash slash J A E hyphen fiction dot com. I do not. I do that not because I think my novels are the best ever, but because I know them best and I can quote from them as much as I want without violating anyone's copyright or humiliating a few writers for mistakes they've made. Smart move. I will also use examples, not just from popular books, but also from well-known movies. The same storytelling principles apply to both novels and movies, and I want to double my chances of you being familiar with some of the examples I'm using. If you haven't seen the movies or read the books and still want to do so, you might want to skip the example to avoid spoilers. Next section, a note on pronouns. Fiction is as diverse as life. You might be writing about a character who identifies as female, male, non-binary, or something else entirely. Throughout this book, I'll use they, them, their as a singular gender neutral pronoun, unless I'm talking about a specific character whose pronouns are he, his or she, her. Happy reading and writing. Sandra Girth. And then it takes us to exercise one and two. But just like with book number one, I stopped there. This is only about half an hour. Damn. Well, that's fine. It's a good return to doing this since I haven't done one of these in a month. And with that, we cometh to a close. Here are all the links and things. All right, so if we were on Twitch, you could use the commands, but I'll be having a thing for links in the description, so that's fine. But it's Monriah Titans on Twitch, Instagram, Twitter, Threads, YouTube. Now, the Monriah Titans Instagram and Twitter is more for me. In threads, I basically post about everything. If you want to know more about yeah, more for everything, because that's mainly for the opinions and truth blog and anything else I plan on posting to it. Since the weekend, a game show is a 
branch of opinions and truth. I created a bunch of links for it. So if you want to know more about opinions and truth, the artist shout outs, then you go to become empowered on Instagram, be empowering on Twitter. I tried to make those match. I really did. But be empowering was taken on Instagram and become empowered was taken on Twitter. They might be mad at me. I don't care. And I am also an artist myself under Titans Monraya Art. Those I managed to make all match. And in addition, you see it a little bit there, but my favorite affiliation is bookshop.org, what I like to call it's call the Etsy for small business bookstores. Wanna get away from Amazon? Support the channel. Get more books for yourself. Well, then you can achieve three skips with a stone. And go to bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash Monriah Titans. See, like pixel, pixel, pixel chat captioner thing I use. They're, they're trying. It, it's really, really trying and I appreciate it so much. And this bringeth me to the end. <laughs> Remember, we are gamers not because we don't have a life, but because we choose to have many, which can also be said of readers. If anyone asks you why you like video games, or why them a game is a problem-solving activity approached with a playful attitude. A quote by Jesse Shell. And if anyone gives you shit for your interest, tell them you may not like video games. You may not like video games, but what I learned from them is this. No enemies in front of you means you are going the wrong way. Thank you for watching. May every decision you make in the future be in the spirit of fairness and may the rest of your day not go to shit. See you next time. Not go to shit. See you next time.